Looks like the door is about to close. So what I'd like to do is talk today a little bit about uh, real-time learning. And not just generally how to do it, but the details of how to do it. Seems like uh, that's the least I could do for a DevOps uh, audience, uh, which seems to be far more interested in how things actually work than most audience. So my name is Ted Dunning. I'm Chief Application Architect for MapR, also a committer on several Zookeeper, uh, Apache projects, including Zookeeper, Mahout, and uh, the brand new Apache Drill. You can contact me anytime you like, any way you like. The slides from here, yes, that's the right URL, uh, are available already if you'd like those. And uh, they'll be on the conference website, I believe, as well. Uh, there's some good hashtags. So what's real-time learning? That's what we're going to talk about first. And then also, I'm going to pose a sample problem. It's a toy, but it illustrates some of the, uh, the problems here. And in talking about that problem, I want to talk a little bit about the philosophy of, of what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we're doing it. And then finally, talk about the solution and the architecture of a system that can make this happen using standard big data tools. So big real-time learning is a kind of learning where data arrives at any time. And it arrives one piece at a time. And we're not allowed to retain more than that piece. So that the training uh, must be order one time for each unit of thing coming in. It must also have order one constant amount of space that it consumes. And it must not, therefore, preserve all of the data. That means that the traditional sorts of machine learning, where you gather a large amount of data and then you inspect that over and over again, is just suddenly out of bounds. It just isn't going to happen in a real-time sense. And so we need new technologies to make this happen. Let's suppose, for instance, that we have a product to sell. A lot of people sell that. A lot of people try to sell products from websites. So here's our website. Let's try to sell dog food. We give a very catchy name for it, uh, an advanced design here of the website, a few details missing. That's the way high-level architecture is always done. Leave the hard part for later. And so we, uh, we have questions here. Which picture should we put there? Should we put the, the happy dog? Should we put the happy family? The pretty girl, the motorcycle, you know, which, which one really drives the purchase of this kind of dog food? Should we perhaps think about the marketing text? Is it the best possible? Maybe there could be something better done. And perhaps five is not the right number. Maybe we should buy one instead of five. So the problem here is we want to find good designs. And there's many decisions here that we have to make, not just an A or a B. We have to make many multivariate decisions, and presumably these decisions will interact. And so the best designers, in general, if we want the designers to succeed, we have to paradoxically let them fail. In order to succeed, you have to fail, or at least feel free to fail. If you cannot fail, then you cannot ever come up with the really great ideas that are high risk and very often high reward. But the, the problem here is that we have to drive the cost of failure to a very low point, because otherwise it will eat us alive. And so let's, let's think about philosophy for a moment here. What we're trying to do here is something statistical. And so statisticians always bring out a coin. That's the illustration. Coin, now, if I'm going to flip the coin like that, if I'm going to flip the coin, what's the probability of heads? Somebody say, come. 50% is what people say. Now, how many people were in my talk last night? Okay, so they know perhaps not to trust me. But this is a philosophical exercise, not an entertainment thing. So if I, before I flip it, the probability everybody seems to say is 50%, except for certain cynics. But what about after I flip it? So. You know, beforehand, it's 50-50. And I flip it now. It was tails, by the way. And I flip it again. It's tails again. But now I flip it one more time. Now, it is already flipped. 
It has a state. What's the probability of heads? You're going to have to answer this time. He says 50%, but it's already flipped. Nothing is going to change. But you still say 50%. I look at it. I grin evilly. What's the probability of heads now? I can't hear you. He still says 50%. Is that what I will say? Will I say the same probability? Sam? Say, I'll say zero or one. What's the difference between us? I mean, I'm up here and I have a microphone, but what's the important difference between us? I know I looked at something. I looked at it. I know something. It's tails, by the way. So, uh, something about this, then the answer changes when we look at the coin. The probability that it is heads changes when we look at the coin. Okay. Flip it again. It's tails. We have data now, right? We don't have data of the same kind as when we looked at the coin. What's the probability of heads? 50%, he says. And so next to him, what's the probability of tails? Come now. 50% heads, what's the probability of tails? <laughs> what? Let, let him say 50, okay? Reserve always a little bit for surprise. <laughs> okay. So, did the answer ever really have a single value? And what does probability mean then? Probability is a measure of what we know and what we do not know. And in machine learning, encoding what we don't know is critical to truly learning, and especially the kind we're talking about today. So there. I think we have a consensus that the probability changes as we gain information. You are now anointed as Bayesians. Do not tell frequentists that this thing has happened to you. They, they will argue with you. Uh, they will talk about the infinite possibilities of the coin and things like that. But the fact is, the way people do talk about probability does change according to what they know. Now, let's play another game. Uh, you've probably seen this on the street. Uh, it's a game where you try to find the P. Okay? So, do we have any choice? I mean, any preferred choice? Does the one on the left better than the one on the right? Or the one in the middle? Seems symmetrical here, because we know nothing. So which one do we start with? The one in the middle. But I said there was no difference. Everybody says the one in the middle. Uh, perhaps I was wrong. So is there a mouse? Yes, okay. Oh. <laughs> now, this is a probabilistic game. This is a Schrodinger's P. It could be anywhere. It could be multiple places. We can only look at one place at a time. Who would like to look next? And where? Somebody say something. The one on the right, somebody says. Why? Why not? Yeah, oh. At this point, you begin to doubt me, right? I, I, I cheat once. So what next? Why the left? Why not the ones that already we know are losers, huh? Oh. We're back to symmetry again, except we know that it's possible for the P to be not there. What else next? The one on the right, okay. Oof, this is terrible. Next? Left. Next? The right again. Okay, and left again. I've never seen it this many times. Ah, we found a P, okay. Now, where next? Middle, middle why? Because you found it at least once, okay. Oh, perhaps not. Maybe there. No. Change? Don't change? Okay, so somebody write this down, all right? Can you write these down from now, the data that we collect? I've got a pen. Can you write this down? You ready? We need to record data. You can record the data, right? Okay. 
So we've had a few successes in the middle. I can't remember if we've had any successes on the left or right. But if we, if we just start uh, doing this, oh, there's one on the left. Uh, oh, there's one in the middle. See, it really was just bad luck. Oh, zero there. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit faster. You ready? OK. <laughs> you got it? OK. Uh, does anybody have an impression of what we should be doing? So is one better than the other? Let's cheat. Let's actually record the data with the computer here. Uh, it was counting all along. So these are the probability, or not the probabilities, the percentages that we got P's in each one of those. And so which one would you pick next? Are you sure, absolutely sure, that the right one's the best? No. No. So if I bet you if, you, if you had to put up one euro, if you had to put up 100 euros, and I put up one dollar, regardless of exchange rates, would you bet it's on the right? No. If it were the other way, would you bet on the right? Yeah. OK, so he has some idea, but he has some uncertainty. And this betting kind of begins to pull out of his opinion about this. Did you get all that down? All of the data? No. OK. Uh, that's silly. Um, and you can see the per percentages are changing substantially now. The, the one in the middle is catching up. Nope, it's falling behind. But the one on the right is falling back. Would you still bet on the right? So it's difficult. And we have a few con con conclusions that we can draw here. One is, can you identify the winners or losers without trying something? No, you can't. So you have to play to win. You have to play to learn. You have to try the shell that you've never tried, even though you might have a thing that's looking pretty good. Can you ever completely eliminate a shell? Could it just be bad luck? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the coin came up tails a lot of times there. And oddly enough, it is a fair coin. Uh, and should you keep trying the losers, the apparent losers? Yeah, because they might be winners. Therefore, we have to keep trying a little bit. OK, so now you understand this problem, at least at an intuitionist level. And this is the same problem as the website, except a little bit simpler. Now, is there an optimum strategy? This was a, a problem that's occupied uh, mathematicians for much of the 20th century. And in the 30s, somebody posited, um, a guy named Thompson, hypothesized an optimal strategy, which turned out to be correct. But people ignored that from a long time. And he said, we should pick each shell according to the probability, our uncertain probability, that it has the highest payoff. Now, we don't know what the payoff is, so we have to do this fancy integral. We have to integrate over all of the possible probabilities, not just all the possible outcomes. And for each one of those possible probabilities, we have to do that. Now, I promised a simple answer, then, and we have it here. We can just sample the parameters that we estimate. So we, we, we had, in our case, these percentages. And so if we were to sample our estimated probabilities, the one on the left would have 18% plus or minus some amount. The one on the right would have 42% plus or minus some amount. And that sampling does not estimate our best answer. It finds just a sample of the best answer. And so that sampling embodies that probabilistic notion of which one we know is best or that we don't know anything. And if we don't know anything, then any of them could be the best. As we begin to refine our knowledge, one of them becomes our estimate of the best. And as an interesting sidelight, this is the number of citations for that original paper from 1935. It was completely ignored until the mid-90s. And suddenly, it is now the fashion. Because this algorithm is what Google and Yahoo and Microsoft and others are now using for ad targeting. Google's content experiments are based on this algorithm. So this is now becoming a ubiquitous thing because it is so effective. So we're going to compute the distributions based on the data so far, sample a probability for each one of the shells, and then pick the one with the highest sample, not estimate. The probability that this 
is going to pick the right shell according to that Thompson sampling lemma is that's the correct answer. And the interesting thing is that that is within a very small fraction of the optimum. And if we compare it to something that's popularly assumed to be an excellent answer, the, the epsilon greedy, you can see that uh, this is score, this is called regret. And up is bad, down is good. And so you can see the gray line declines much faster and stays much lower than epsilon greedy. We can have a video here of several of these here. So this is a complex thing. What we have is these arrows. There are the arrows. And they represent different shells. We're going to have five shells here, the different probabilities of each of the shells. The purple shell has a very low probability of having a P. The red shell has the highest probability at about one half. The light green shell is almost as good and the blue shell is very bad, and the dark green one is not so bad. So we're going to let the system pick which shell to show, to try. And you can see that the, the light green distribution there, that curve, has kind of, we've, we've gotten several tries now on light green, and we've had some successes and a failure or so. And so it's now saying that the probability is kind of in this upper half. Red, I think, has been tried once with a failure, once with a success. So it says, hey, that's kind of in the middle. But the sample of red could easily be higher than the sample for green because both of them are so broad. Make sense? I mean, it's easy so far. It really is easy. And we can see now in the middle, this is the proportion that it's giving to each of the options. And right now it's already decided that purple and blue are horrible, and so it's pushed them down very far. It's hardly giving any traffic to those. And the, the bottom line is that regret number that we saw on the previous slide. And you can see how that went down even very quickly. So after, you can't read the scale, but after about 20 trials, we had already cut the regret in half because it was so clear that the bad options were so bad. So it's cutting away the failures very quickly. And if we let it continue, you can see red has gone up, but green by accident might have a recovery. Those are the two that are getting most of the data, but you'll see blue and light green or dark green occasionally bumping and changing shape. That's because they will, they're, they're, blue got another one. So they're getting data very rarely, but red and light green are the real ones that get most of the data. And red, as it gets more and more narrow, because it's getting a whole lot of data, will come to dominate the, the situation. So this thing is learning as it goes. But more importantly, unlike most machine learning, it's also deciding which examples it wants to learn about. Because learning costs this algorithm something. Picking a bad one will cost it something. But then permanently picking a bad one, i.e. not learning, is even worse. And so it's trading off the cost of certainty and the cost of uncertainty in real time. The algorithm literally is as complicated as counting. So let's go into some more details about how it's working. So the idea here is we can encode this distribution, this, this uncertainty that we have about the coin. We can encode that by sampling. Before I forced everybody to give me one answer, what is the probability of the coin? But really there was a lot of doubt it might have been zero, it might have been a hundred, especially after it came up tails five times, you would start to say, hmm, maybe zero is a good answer. And so this idea that instead of giving a single answer, you could just sample, give any answer that seems consistent with your experience. That's the idea. And that turns the rest of the system into a dis deterministic system. By being deterministic, then, we can just we can ask you one question. You can give me one answer. We don't have to do the, the Schrodinger experiment where we put him in a box with radioactive things and give a whole cloud of possibilities. It's very hard to build quantum websites that, that are non-deterministic that way. This allows real websites to function in this sort of algorithm. And we can extend it now. If you remember the original problem here, this is the extension that we want. So we had a variable which represented which picture. We had a variable which represented which text. 
might have five versions of text and three pictures. We have a, a variable which represents which kind of button, which color, which text to put on the button. And so we can express this mathematically where each of the X's here, come on X's, where are you? There we go. So each of the X's here has a value of zero or one according to which option we pick. And we have parameters here which we don't know initially. And we combine those to get an estimate of the probability of a conversion on this. This is our model. It's a common model. And we can convert that linear combination non-linearly using logistic regression or probit regression. Those are just standard sort of neural net soft thresholds. So all we need to do is now sample these thetas from the uncertainty that remains after our experiments, sample thetas, and find the best x that gives us the highest probability of conversion. And we don't have to use the nonlinear part here. We can do a search in the linear space because it's bigger is better through that weighting function. So we've got a very simple algorithm here, almost as simple as it was before. The only difference now is that learning this is a little bit more complicated than it was before. With the, the coin or with the shells, learning there only matters, is a matter of counting how many heads, how many tails, how many P's, how many non-P's, and then using a beta distribution. Here we have to use a bit more of a fancy learning algorithm, but it can still be done online. Now we can also have other variables, other variables like this. So we might have the, the ID of the user themselves or where they live, the geographic characteristics. We might have other environmental characteristics. What time is it? So some things we can change. We can change the design characteristics. We can pick which website we show somebody. Some things we can't, the, the environmental variables, they just are what they are right now. The user came from Japan, that's where they're from. We can't move the user to be from Iowa. That's what they are. And so we have two kinds of variables, X's and Y's. And we just have to find a model that represents both of these and their interactions. We have to just find the best X's now. It's the same algorithm, except now we have more parameters. We have the X parameters, we have the interaction parameters, we have the Y parameters. But the learning algorithm is the same. And the, the finding the maximum is done the same way, except we have, have a linear search over three things, except the last one doesn't matter because Y we can't change anyway. We can only change X. So we just have to walk through the combinations and find the best one for the sample that we have. Now, there are a few surprises. This has to do with delay. If, if something is converging, if our website has a visitor and we look at time passing, some people will convert very quickly because they really wanted the dog food. Some people have to think about it for a long time. And so the conversion rate will go up for different designs and it will go up toward the maximum eventually. And if we wait a long time and measure, like T3 here, then we'll be able to find the best one. But the interesting thing is we can measure sooner. We won't know what the actual conversion rate is, but we know the order is correct. And very often we can measure very, very soon after the impression where T1 is, because the order will still be the right order. So we'll build a model, a T1 model, and the key thing there is you don't learn anything until T1 time has passed. Once T1 has passed, then you can say it succeeded or failed. So, the required steps. This is all we need to do. We learn the distribution of the parameters. This is a packaged routine. It's logistic regression. It has to be a Bayesian logistic regression so that we can do the next step, which is to sample from these parameters. And then we pick a design that seems to be best from the sample and then we record the data and push it back around. Simple. How do we build it? Okay. Is everybody kind of on board here? I, I put the real stuff in here, A, uh, because this is DevOps, but also because people can refer back to these slides and look at this, have something to ask questions about later. It's no sense that you have to 
scribble this down right now and internalize it all. But the problem here is in real-time learning, many systems that we normally use for big data are not very real-time. The problem, say, with Hadoop is that it works in batches. And the batches could be short, they could be one minute, but they're still non-zero. And so the latest full period we haven't processed because it takes a time to process it. And if we're sitting right there, the latest full period and a part of the next period is unprocessed. And so Hadoop works well on the long past, but not so well on the recent past. This is a fundamental problem with a batch system. So what we want to do is we want to take Hadoop with its qualities and we want to combine it with a real-time system which can be doing this learning in real-time and then we can be doing much longer and more complicated retrospections using Hadoop offline. But we want to combine them. We want to combine them so the real-time system meets the long-time system exactly. We don't want overlap and we don't want a gap. And so we need to find a blended view which views recent and long time together. Now, if we're going to build a system like this website optimizer in traditional terms, we would take something like Kafka to take the incoming data and buffer it so that we could have a little bit of disconnection between the input and the processing. We would use something like Storm to do the real-time processing. That's the second cluster. We would host the website on some sort of shared storage, and we would run a Flume cluster to collect the data from the real-time system, and we would run long-term clustering using Hadoop. How many clusters is that? That's a lot of complexity. We wind up with a system diagram that looks like this, except much bigger. All kinds of pieces everywhere. This is not good. This is, this is complex. It's a lot of moving parts. It's not nice. And so what we want to do then is build the system on a single platform. We want to host the queuing system. We want to host the, the real-time system and the long-time system all on the same platform. And that leads to some certain constraints. We want to be able to talk with the real-time system to the exact same storage as the queuing system as the long-time system. So here's an alternative architecture there, which I should put the red hat back on because it, it involves our logo, but uh, hey, I do this sometimes. Uh, but it's a much simpler design, and you can see how if you have real-time file system that's shared and clustered, provides big data and fast data, you can mix these systems together. Now. How many people think you can do it yourself? Yeah, at least two, three. It's getting higher. Yeah, we can do them this. It turns out that there really isn't that hard to do, especially in the A-B testing sort of case. It is 10 lines of code to do the shell problem, and that's the A-B testing. It's a few more, maybe 100 lines of code, to build this for the, the full website. And system-wise, it's a simple thing. You just have to record data cleanly and be able to turn live systems, upgrade real-time systems on the fly, so you need the queuing. But other than that, there's very little mechanism needed. It's, it's, it's not simple, otherwise people would have done it 40 years ago, well, 20 years ago. Uh, but it isn't that hard. And this is a thing that you can do. Uh, friends at Octo are talking about the practices of the giants with their book that they're pushing here. And this is one of the things that differentiates the most successful people on the web from the less successful. And that is that they measure, they respond, and they understand what they know and they don't know. And so we can encode all of that into a mathematical system like this. What I'd like to do is spend this next 10, 20 minutes now and let's talk about what systems you guys have and how this would apply. So who would like to ask what's happening or talk about what system they have where they might like to apply this? Anybody? Come on. Sam, what do you do? No, no, I'll repeat the question. So you do the same thing you say? Uh, yes, but I don't use Hadoop actually. So website optimization? 
No. Market research. Market research. Okay. Trading risk strategies. Yeah, a lot of big data there. A lot of fast data there. So trading risk strategies, very often what you have there are multiple models. So you can be learning by any mechanism you like, and this system can be a meta model. It can be deciding which model is working well. And one of the characteristics that leads to is that if you have a short-term model that's learning just from a few days and a long-term model that's learning from years, if the market changes, the short-term model starts doing better. And this model can detect that very quickly and switch over. So there's a, there's a very good, very different application. Not at all what I was saying here, but it works exactly the same way. This system would think of the alternative algorithms as shells, impenetrable boxes, no, no idea what's inside, and it would merely look at their performance and try to characterize that over time. Anybody else have a system that might work like this? High-speed trading, anybody does that here? Besides Sam? How, who has a website? One person. Who else works with, oh, two people. Hallelujah, three, here we go, come on. Uh, who works on a website? Uh, does anybody, yeah, I mean, there's plenty of people here, there have to be, who work against websites. What about email commands? Yeah, the only difference there is that we had a time scale, which I denominated in supposed seconds, up to 10 minutes. An email campaign would go out to four weeks because people don't respond to email quickly. Otherwise, it's identical. Now, you probably don't want to send all the email right away because you want to get some feedback before you commit all of the sends. But otherwise, it's identical. It just has a longer delay. It's the same idea. So you would have multiple campaigns, multiple components of campaigns, and this would let you do that. Not only that, but if you have multiple targeting technologies, this would let you combine them. Targeting technology A makes this decision. B makes that decision. Which one do you pick? Well, you can figure out which one you trust the most using this system. And so it can automatically make a decision between alternative technologies, even if they are inaccurate about their own estimate of quality. Easy. And you have all this offline time to process it. S somebody else, come on. Yeah. Okay. So, so to paraphrase what you're saying, you have an event system that you have a lot of people interacting with. They submit events. You automatically put tags on them so that people who subscribe to tags will find out about events in their area. Okay. And do you have just one technology for putting on tags? No. No, you have lots of technologies. Yeah, so you want to classify them. And what is the right category? Is it the category that you believe is right, or is it the category that, you that your email reader believes is right? Uh, they, uh, there are two possibilities. Uh, the, the, the event creators can say, okay, this is from uh, the categories, uh, let's say, big data. And uh, in, in that case, you just uh, push it to your, um, to your system, to your model, as a library uh, events, and say, okay, this is an event from big data. Sure. And use it, if you receive similar events, then uh, just learn similar one as big data. That is the, the, the idea. Uh, then if uh, another creator send an event without a category label, 
now you should you should learn from your model what is the category of this event and but 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 the truth here of what is an event in a big data or whatever it is an event that big data people like yeah. yeah yeah and so you have good training data you have multiple models yeah and so you have a meta model problem which yeah. is the best model to use uh, yes it is a it is a multi class uh, classifier yeah and you register for you register your interest in big data you register for big data events. When we receive an event, we classify it. Uh, the model we say, okay, this is 50% big data or 20% Java. Yeah. And but the model there is has context who it's sending the email to, and so it gets to decide which events it talks about. So it's still the same problem. We have many events. The model needs to decide which events to send to you yeah. and how to present them. So it's the same problem again. Another one. Let's get one from over here. Anybody have a problem like this? Okay. Guy's got a big smile on his face. <laughs> In the back, there's somebody there. Here's a microphone coming your way, because I won't be able to hear you. Thanks. Um, so you were, you were explaining there was you know, variables that we control and other variables that we don't control. Yes. Uh, in the end, do you like group by the variables that you don't control, maybe with some kind of aggregation to let's say have a red button for Japan because they like it better and, and have a blue button for the rest of the world or something like that? So th the question is, do you aggregate over these very, there's two questions there. Do, do you choose just one, you know, one solution or do you try to adjust for the actual customer, the best solution for the customer as far as, as, far as you know? We, we pick theta and pi, these, these parameters. And those define what is the best overall model. That's what the theta values are doing. And also these pi values are telling us which are the best models relative to the environmental variables, the y variables. And so then we pick within this environment what we think is the best design in this environment. So yes, as you say, a red button might be good in Japan because red's a good color there. Might be a bad idea in a very calm place that thinks red is an unlucky color. So those context dependent things would be showing up here and one X would say red button and if it's zero it would be say blue button. And then a Y would have in Japan it's equal to one everywhere else perhaps equal to zero. And so we would have a value for pi for red button in Japan, blue button in Japan, red button everywhere else, blue button everywhere else. But you have to pre-select the kind of um, splitting you're doing. Right? You cannot have the system learn it uh, by itself, you know, like I don't know. Tokyo people like, it turns out Tokyo people like red and uh, outside Tokyo is like, um, I don't know, rose. Yeah, so, yeah, we do need to, to pick things. But remember that in the end, we have to record the data in a log. Tuck, tuck, here we go. Talk to me, PowerPoint. So we have to put the data into a log file somehow. And so the data that we record there is the data that we get to model from. And if somebody uses very detailed geographic information, then we can make it less detailed over time. But if they don't make it detailed at the beginning, if they just say country code, then we can never make it more detailed unless we have that data in there somehow. So outside of the learning system, we've already made a big decision about which data we even look at. And that, that's always going to be true. Now, we could try to get as, as detailed information by policy. We always try to do that. We can try to give it as, as granular as possible. And, and if we use a good learning system, it will look at that and it will generalize, say, oh, here's a general characteristic of all of Japan. Or it might say, and, and, and if it says all of Japan, then it would put zeros on all of the most specific things. 
or if it says, oh, I have to do something very specific here, it might put a zero on just the Japan weight. But we have to make a decision when we collect the data as to which data we have, and that invariably drives the question of which data we can use in a model. There's no philosophical way out of that. The system can only work with what it perceives, as we can, in fact. We rarely make product buying decisions based on the ultraviolet colors of things. Bees do, birds do, but we don't. And because we just don't collect the data. Okay, you know, we just we live with what we can do. More questions? Well, if not, we're going to have to say goodbye, and then we can come together informally and ask some questions and talk about things. Then thank you very much for coming.